reaching out to other places as well. Yeah. Thank you, Clive. Uh, and, I, and now you're going to be presenting our featured uh, program? Yes. Um, it is uh, great, my great pleasure to introduce my dear friend, Hannah Campbell. Uh, Hannah is an environmental education professional specializing in marine science and conservation education and leadership. In her primary role, she serves as the Director of Education at Loggerhead Marine Life Center, which is a sea turtle research, rehabilitation, and conservation organization in Juneau Beach, Florida. Annually, Loggerhead Marine Life Center's education team serves over 72,000 students with a focus on traditionally underserved communities, greatly appreciated these days. Accruing a decade of service with Loggerhead Marine Life Center, Anna serves as a senior leader for all education department, full-time staff members, seasonal staff and volunteers, fostering a team that strives to empower individuals with knowledge, tools, and resources to take responsible action for marine and coastal environments. It doesn't end there. Hannah also serves as the Southeast Regional <laughs> Director for the Florida Marine Science Educators Association, also known as FEMC. As a matter of fact, Salisha and I are lifetime members of that. As the Southeast Regional Director, uh, she is responsible for connecting formal, informal, and non-formal educators across seven southeastern counties in order to collaborate and share resources for students, their families, and their communities. Hannah is also a facilitator and a trainer for the Aquatic Species Collection Workshop, which is a three-year certification for educators issued by the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. And she assists also in coordinating the annual FEMC conference. She is a lead instructor for the University of Florida's Florida Master Naturalist Programs, Palm Beach County Teaching Team. Who and has been <laughs> an invited instructor at the Audubon Science, uh, Audubon Society of, of the Everglades Conservation uh, Stewardship Course since 2016. It is my great pleasure to introduce this evening's program speaker, my dear friend, Ms. Hannah Campbell. Yay! Um, Thank you so much, Clive. Oh my goodness. You're, you're welcome. I was hoping that would be for reading, not out loud, but you know, you really <laughs> did me justice there. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. I just wanna make sure that everybody can see it. Anybody wants to chat in the Q and A that they can see my screen and presentation? That would be a great help. All right, I'm not hearing anything, so I think we're having luck. Great, thanks, Jeannie. All right, well, um, good evening, everybody. My name is Hannah Campbell. I am not going to give you any additional introduction than you've already gotten um, to get to know me. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Hopefully you all will have lots of questions um, at the end of the presentation. I know this is a little bit, I'm sure, outside of the typical guest presenter you have um, in the Audubon Society talking about turtles and not birds. Um, but I did fully disclose to Scott and Clive that I am not the best person to talk anything about birds. <laughs> so I guess they made special permission so I can talk about turtles tonight. So what we're going to be doing is um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about uh, the importance of the ocean as it ties into human health. Um, I won't stay on that topic for too long because we're uh, limited, but there are so many reasons why ocean conservation should be important to everybody um, and that it's directly related to our um, health as a species. Um, and then we will um, watch one of the most ancient processes on the planet and I am actually going to virtually transport all of you down to our local beaches here to watch a sea turtle um, lay her eggs and return to the ocean after a successful nest. Um, so I'm really looking forward to sharing that with you. 
Okay, so a little bit of housekeeping. Um, those of you that are not familiar with Loggerhead Marine Life Center, we are a not-for-profit organization located here in Juneau Beach, Florida. Um, and we have four uh, primary foci um, of our organization. And I'm just going to try to open a video. I just wanna make sure you guys can see it for each one of these. Let's see. Well, sorry, everybody. I'm just going to reshare my screen because that's not going to work for us today. I'm going to try one more time. Okay, I think you all can see this now. Um, so I'm just going to go through a couple videos that demonstrate some of the education, research, conservation, and rehabilitation efforts here at Loggerhead. They're short videos and I'm just going to let them play while I narrate. So um, what you're looking at here is actually a 360 video um, that we have recorded of the South Florida um, reef tract here in uh, the Palm Beaches. I'm actually the diver in this video. I'll see if you can see a little piece of me over here. <laughs> That's me and my scuba gear. Um, and this is actually part of an effort that we put together in our new virtual reality headsets that we take into classrooms to transport students of all ages, K through 12, um, actually onto the reef. So we, our education department is really trying to um, make sure that technology is integrated into our learning lessons and make sure that our programming is staying relevant and current um, and keeping up with the technology trends. You can see here that this is a resting mama sea turtle um, on the reef system. And the kids, when they put on their headsets, they're just so excited um, to be on the reef. And some of them, when they have their headsets on, they try and hold their breath. So. Anyway, it's, it's, uh, it's really fun here in education. And then as the Director of Education and being in this department um, going on 10 years now, it's been really um, great to see some of the progress we've made with, um, with technology. So then we are also a rehabilitation center. So this is just a sample video, really quick one of uh, a sea turtle. It's a loggerhead sea turtle, his name is Gavin. Um, so our, our rehabilitation team sees about 40 to 60 sub-adult through adult patients um, a year, and then that's not counting the hundreds on average of hatchlings that we see per year. Um, although we are not a zoo, we're not an aquarium, we are a sea turtle hospital, so um, the goal is for all the sea turtles that enter into our um, sea turtle hospital here at Loggerhead Marine Life Center is to eventually get released back into the ocean like Gavin here. So we do, our facility is free to the public. Um, if you have not been for a visit, please come up um, whenever you're comfortable and it's safe for you to do so. Um, again, we're right here in Juneau Beach and uh, we do have a fully accessible outdoor sea turtle hospital where we have about 18 to 25 sea turtle patients at any given time. And then we have our research team and they have fun uh, surveying and, and monitoring these little guys during this time of year. What you're looking at is a um, hatch out of what we call a hatch out or a boil because it looks like a pot of water boiling of green sea turtles. Um, and our research team not only does the annual nest monitoring to evaluate the health of the population of sea turtles here um, on our local beaches, they monitor just under 10 miles of them, but they also do year round studies um, of different elements of sea turtle health and, and population dynamics. Um, we do have a special leatherback project as well. And then we have our conservation team. 
This is just a quick clip of uh, underwater cleanup that we did at the Juno Beach Pier. We operate the Juno Beach Pier year round in partnership with Palm Beach County. Um, this was a little crab that was rescued because it was entangled in monofilament fishing line. So we were able to salvage this little guy and he looks a little crabby when you look at him, <laughs> but I think he was kind of grateful of what happened. Um, so our conservation team is primarily involved with marine debris removal, both from beaches. We have monthly beach cleanups, of course, when things are normal and COVID-19 doesn't get in the way. Um, and we also do these underwater cleanups to try and maintain the, the debris levels in our local systems. All right, so I'm going to scoot back over to my presentation. All right, so that's a little bit about us. Hopefully you enjoyed the videos a little bit better than these, uh, these photos. But education, rehabilit sea turtle rehabilitation, research, and conservation are our primary pillars here. And our mission is to promote the conservation of ocean ecosystems with a special focus on threatened and endangered sea turtles. So, but we can't have sea turtle conservation if we don't have ocean conservation. So a big part of our mission is the protection and the promotion um, of the conservation of our reef system. Um, here in South Florida. So that primarily means the South Florida Reef Track. So we're involved with a lot of partnerships um, with coral restoration um, and reef monitoring that makes sure that the habitat that these sea turtles occupy is also in good health. I could spend a whole nother presentation talking about the health um, or threats and, and some successes of the Florida Reef Track, but we're gonna stick to sea turtles today. So before I get started um, and go any further, that was just kind of housekeeping for Loggerhead Marine Life Center. We are gonna talk about sea turtles now. I did just want to know what value the ocean has for you guys. So I'm gonna try and make this a little interactive. I know um, these virtual presentations aren't what we uh, want it to be. So using the Q&A box, feel free to type in, uh, just make sure everybody can see it and it's not a private message to the host, but make sure to uh, type in what you think. So what is the va what, ocean, what value does the ocean hold for you? Do you, when you think of the ocean, do you think of recreation? Are you a, are you a swimmer? Um, do you think of aesthetics? Do you go and see the sunrises? Do you think it has intrinsic value just for being beautiful? Um, are you a seafood eater? So um, uh, is seafood and the health of seafood important in your lives? Or do you just simply like to vacation in coastal areas or all of the above? Feel free to chatted in the Q&A so I can see how everybody's feeling. It's also possible that you just might not really have a value for the ocean. Maybe you, you know, weren't, didn't have a lot of experiences with the ocean growing up. Maybe you're a recent transplant um, to Florida and coastal communities and you stick to upland habitats where there's the birds that you like. <laughs> Although, spoiler alert, there are a lot of birds on the coast, of course, too. See if anybody has something to say here. Aesthetic, aesthetic. I agree, Helen, the health of the ocean is critical to the survival of the planet and everything on it. We're gonna talk a little bit about that. I see a lot of the above, all of the above, good. Awesome, so I'm in good company, I think is what I'm seeing. So those of you that maybe weren't sure, or maybe just aesthetics, which I don't, which is which is equally as important. Uh, the ocean does have intrinsic beauty that um, is important to the biodiversity of our planet, of course. Um, but there are two main things I just wanted to point it out quickly in this abbreviated um, presentation. So a healthy ocean benefits the health of not only our planet but us as humans. So those of you that don't know, phytoplankton produces more than 50% of the Earth's oxygen, which of course is vital to our breathing. Um, many of you may have heard that rainforests hold a critical role um, with the uh, production of oxygen on our planet. Well, I'm here to tell you that so does the ocean. Um, and this is something that is, has been historically a disconnect um, with people, is that these tiny uh, planktonic plant organisms are really responsible for, for photosynthesis as well, just like any other plant in the rainforest, and that oxygen production is vital to our health. Um, another thing uh, that I kind of wanted to point out that is a common disconnect is that the ocean really serves as a holding tank um, for a lot of water on our planet. Does anybody know the percentage of water 
that uh, the ocean holds on the planet? Anybody want to type that into the q and I'm seeing some more of your answers, calming, stress, aesthetic, great. We're seeing 90, 80, 75, 90. Good guesses, good guesses. So Frederick, you're, you're about the closest. It's about 70 to 72% um, is covered uh, in salt water in our ocean. So a lot of, you know, growing up uh, and in, in our schooling, we may have thought about the ocean as very segmented into, you know, the, the Pacific Ocean, the Atlantic Ocean, et cetera, et cetera. But really, if you think about it, the ocean is, um, the medium on earth that really knows no physical boundaries, right? It's, it's a liquid. Um, so it really is all connected and we kind of, uh, we consider that our, our one world ocean, right? Um, and many people uh, don't connect the fact that 86% of the global evaporation comes from the ocean. So that fresh water that's coming down, about 86% of it was evaporated in that good old water cycle um, right from the ocean. So without that big holding tank of water, even though we don't drink salt water ourselves, it's critical to the drinking water that we get replenished in our aquifers and in our drinking water system um, as human beings. <laughs> My little arrow graphic. All right. So I'm gonna, the maintaining the health of the ocean is everybody's job, not just humans, but animals as well. Um, so there's a natural system, what we call a food web. And this is a little bit of a, an older um, way to think about what we would now call the food web and kind of this food chain dynamic, where you're really looking at a linear progression up a food chain, but there's a lot of interconnected relationships in there too. Um, but essentially what this is showing is, you know, a healthy, um, uh, planktonic trophic level, um, you know, our, our primary producers all the way up to our top predators are all critical in the success and balance of an ecosystem, just like any terrestrial ecosystem. Um, I know I'm in, in good company with wildlife enthusiasts, so I'm sure that this is not a, a hard concept for you to grasp. It's the same in the ocean. So if, you know, even though we wish that maybe jellyfish would would be eradicated, right? Because they sting us when we come into accidental contact with most of them, you know, without jellies, you know, a lot can go wrong. And same things can be said for sharks. Um, of course, we're gonna be concentrating on sea turtles, but a lot of people think of sharks as a top predator. They're very scary. Maybe I could live without them, but without some of those apex predators, a lot of things would change. So where do sea turtles have a role in this food web um, and in this ocean ecosystem? Well, they, they fill many roles, like a lot of organisms throughout their life cycle. A unique thing about sea turtles is that they have a fairly long life cycle. Um, they are estimated to live to about 80 to 100 years old, um, so they have a very similar life cycle to us, and they've been around for millions of years. So um, they have established a niche, several niches, depending on the species, in the food web that without one of the species or, or you know, goodness forbid, um, any, uh, all of the species, we would be in big trouble. So sea turtles play a critical role in the ocean ecosystems as hatchlings, juveniles, subadults, and then as adults. And we'll get a little bit more into that. But first I figured I'd cover a little bit of the basics. Um, so what is a sea turtle? I'll take you uh, back a little bit to grade school. So they are air-breathing marine reptiles. Um, this is, uh, I'm going to use my cursor here, trying not to move it too much. Um, this is a sea turtle coming up for air here. So the, the, contrary to, to common belief, um, they cannot hold their breath underwater, right? What we know about reptiles is that they uh, do have lungs and they do need to hold their breath if they're submerged in water at any time. So they're like us. Um, most people don't know, or a lot of people ask anyway, that see, uh, how long a sea turtle can hold their breath. Well, they can hold their breath for about up to five hours, um, on average about two to three hours, depending on what they're doing. If they're foraging and if they're hunting for food, um, then they're going to work through that stored oxygen a little bit quicker and need to come up for air. It's like the equivalent of us running a lap in our house versus taking a nap on the couch. Um, they're gonna burn through that a little bit quicker when they're holding their breath. But if they're resting, it could be a couple hours. So that turtle that you saw in the 360 video earlier that was resting on the reef, that turtle, she might be down there for a couple hours before she comes up to breathe again. Um, so they are air breathing. 
Um, they do have a beak or a bill, and uh, these are highly specialized features of the animal. Um, they're a pretty uh, unique adaptation per species based on uh, the niche that they fill in the food web. Um, for example, what you're looking at here is the hawksbill sea turtle. The hawksbill sea turtle has a, a pointier bill, pointier beak, its primary food source um, uh, is sponges. Uh, so what they need to do is they need to work, um, they need to forage on a coral reef system. And if it's healthy, there's a lot of um, nooks and crannies, let's say, and they need that uh, specialized beak that's a little bit narrow to get in tight spaces and also a powerful jaw to, to uh, remove it from the reef system. They are vertebrates. I, I put in a radiograph here so you can kind of see uh, the image of their spine. Whoops. Their spine as well as their ribs coming out here from, uh, front, from their uh, backbone. A uh, common misconception, believe it or not, um, is that sea turtles uh, shed their shells. They definitely do not shed their shells. They are, um, once they're born, they, they never rid their shell, they grow within it. So the shell grows with the animal. So all those cartoons you've seen about a sea turtle leaving their shell, running around naked and entering it again um, is definitely for the cartoon purposes. Um, so that is a similarity that, they, a similarity that they do have with us humans. They are vertebrate animals. Um, they do have non-retractable flippers. So when, pe when most people think about sea, uh, turtles, sorry, they think about, well, when they get scared, they hide in their shell. Well, how does that work for a sea turtle? The answer is it doesn't. Um, they need those flippers for their neutral buoyancy and their balance in the water in order to properly navigate. Um, so they cannot retract their flippers into the shell. So when they're scared, fortunately, they have this very hydrodynamic shape to uh, their shell and these powerful flippers with lots of muscle between the shoulder and the neck to use those front flippers for propulsion um, so they can move quite quickly in the water. In fact, sea turtles have been documented to swim up to 22 miles per hour underwater. They are quite quick. They definitely defy the stereotype of a slow turtle. <laughs> Um, magnetite crystals have been identified in the skull of sea turtles. This is a funny little graphic that uh, we put in here. And, and essentially, um, research, research has shown that it, it is thought to, the most popular theories, is thought to help in the navigation process when sea turtles return to what we call their natal beach when they nest. So for those of you that haven't heard or do not know, um, sea turtles are loyal to their natal beach, which is the beach where they originally hatched out as hatchlings uh, or baby sea turtles on. So um, the maturation period, the um, sea turtles on average, depending on the species, they reach sexual maturity between 25 and 35 years old for most of the species, um, with the exception of uh, leatherbacks reach maturity a little bit earlier. Um, but when they do reach maturity, it's, it's been pending any um, uh, injuries or any strandings, non-natural strandings, if they get injured or hurt and wash up on the beach, let's say, they actually don't return to any terrestrial environment, which would really be the coast or the beaches or maybe a mangrove in other parts of the world, um, until they are ready to lay eggs and if they're female. So males actually stay out in the ocean their entire lives after they hatch out. Um, there are some exceptions to male and female turtles in select places in the world where they will bask um, um, on the beaches, but here in South Florida, that's not the case. So if you ever see a full-grown sea turtle on the beach, they're either sick or injured, or it's a mother laying her eggs during nesting season. Um, so these magnetite crystals help them navigate um, the, the ocean, kind of like a mini GPS system, back to where their natal beach is. And this puzzles a lot of researchers. So if you're thinking to yourself, oh my goodness, that's incredible, it's because it is. Um, and there's a lot of research dedicated to figuring out what factors um, uh, allow the imprinting, what we call imprinting, to happen. And I'm sure you're familiar with that uh, term, uh, being bird people yourselves. So um, there's a lot of different factors that are being studied right now uh, on when the imprinting happens and what, what mechanism has it happened. But the magnetite crystals are thought to have a big, a big role in that. Um, the shell is made up of a carapace and a plastron, so uh, two bone plates. So here in our rehabilitation, our, our sea turtle hospital, um, it does 
uh, made for quite an interesting way to radiograph an animal. Um, we're looking through quite a, a massive bone structure to get to see what we need to see. So we do have a high definition digital x-ray machine that helps us uh, gather that information to get this quality radiograph here. So a little bit about sea turtle um, biology and morphology for you. Um, kind of narrowing the bottleneck down here to um, our species here in South Florida. Worldwide, there are seven species. Some of these may sound familiar to you, some of them perhaps not. Um, I will give you a hint, the Australian flatback is not found in this area of the world. So if that's a new one uh, to you, that's because it's not in our region. Um, but we do uh, see, whoops, thought I had another slide in here. Um, we do see about five species here in South Florida, and um, I'm just gonna use my cursor slowly here. Um, we do see Kemp's Ridleys. It's rare that we'll have a Kemp's Ridley nest uh, here in Florida, but the Kemp's Ridleys do nest quite often in Texas um, and, and other places in the Gulf. Um, we have hawksbills on our reefs, a pretty, pretty healthy population of hawksbills. We will every so often get a hawksbill hybrid nest, which is really interesting, but we will see them on the reefs. Um, leatherbacks, we do have, um, we are part of the, the beaches that we monitor here at Loggerhead Marine Life Center. We have some of the most densely nested leatherback beaches in the continental United States. Um, this year, our number is about 286 leatherback nests, um, and that's just on our 10 mile stretch. So there have been additional leatherback nests in South Florida. Um, and we have a special research program dedicated to them because they are just such fascinating turtles. The virtual turtle walk that you all are going to be joining me on tonight in a little bit, um, it is not a leatherback, but to see that experience is really unique. Um, and I would love it if any of you have had that experience, type it in the chat because I think that that's a really cool story to share. Um, we also have green sea turtles and loggerhead sea turtles. These are kind of our most commonly seen um, sea turtles in this area. Um, loggerheads, of course, being the most abundant um, nesters in our area. Right now, to give you an idea, as of this morning, we have documented 12,833 nests just on less than 10 miles of beach. So by the end of our season, um, research shows that every six feet, you know, during peak season, there's a sea turtle nest on Juno, Jupiter, and Tequesta beaches. Um, so it's pretty remarkable the, dense, the nesting density that we have here. We have researchers travel from all over the United States to study turtles in our area. Um, and then green sea turtles, we have just over 3,000 nests. So all in all, we're over 15,000 nests for the season. And nesting season doesn't end until October 31st. So we still have plenty of activity to go. So this is one of the last slides I have um, as an overview of why sea turtles are critical to ocean and coastal ecosystems. And of course, we've covered just a, the tip of the iceberg of why the ocean is important to us as a species. Um, but sea turtles fill a lot of roles, including controlling habitat. So I know that I had touched on those um, hawksbill sea turtles and how they like to you know, remove sponges from the reef while sponges um, are uh, in competition with other organisms on the reef system. So without that check and balance, we'd be in big trouble. Same goes for green sea turtles that enjoy uh, grazing seagrass in an ecosystem. Um, they nourish beaches. So they are a marine animal that have the unique care, the unique trait of nesting in a terrestrial habitat. Um, so those eggs, once they hatch and those uh, hatchlings go out to the ocean, well, what's left in those nests is a lot of nutrients that um, is absorbed into that terrestrial environment. And while some of you may look at a beach and think of just sand, um, it is very much a changing, evolving, living and breathing ecosystem, just like other coastal ecosystems. So that nourishment is critical. Um, they are an essential food source. We don't like thinking about this part, um, but they are a big part of the food web. So sea turtle um, mothers will lay on average about four to six, although we, I believe we had a, a female that laid uh, eight nests this season, which was some kind of a record for a loggerhead. Um, but they lay on average about three to six nests per season. And in each nest on average, there's about 80 to 120 eggs. If you do the math, that's a lot of um, hatchlings per, per mother that's nesting. 
um, for a season. So the reason for that is because they have the odds stacked against them. So they say that uh, survival rates for, um, for sea turtles when they are hatchlings is about one in a thousand, and that's kind of a generous number. Others, other stats, and it's very hard to um, get a true estimation, but other statistics um, point to even one in 5,000 or more. Um, only that one turtle will make it to adulthood. And that's really what counts, right? Because we want them to continue to propagate the population. If you make it to a juvenile stage, you get a pat on the shell, um, but it's really not going to help propel that uh, population forward. Um, we talked a little bit about the food web check and balance. Um, there's a soft bodied animal here that's getting munched on some jellyfish, et cetera. So um, they keep a lot of those animals in check, just like any organism, any other organism. So they are pretty cr critical. They serve as an indicator species to us. Um, so again, we are, as humans, we are not marine species. So the fact that these marine animals come to us in the terrestrial environment during nesting season is unbelievable. And it really gives us um, a really unique um, perspective into some of the things that are happening out in the ocean, such as um, fisheries impacts. So how are the fisheries impacting animals in the ocean, not just sea turtles, but many others? Um, what are our recreational habits doing to impact animals? Um, I'll show you on our, our next and last slide before the presentation here, or the turtle walk, um, that we see a lot of boat interactions, unintended boat interactions. Um, and then we also see if there's any marine debris ingestion, right, which we'll talk about a little bit in the next slide too. We consider them indicator species, and I know that this is probably no uh, new, new term for you all being bird people, but essentially uh, an indicator species is one that serves um, as a, a measure of the conditions of the environment that they're coming from. And the fact that the, these marine animals come to us, whereas fish can't, right, um, is, is really important for us to have a better understanding about our impacts, okay? So these are just a couple last photos to show you um, what those indicators uh, might be when they come into the sea turtle hospital here at Loggerhead Marine Life Center. You can see in this radiograph, we see some fisheries impacts, some hooks. Fortunately, um, we're able to pretty successfully uh, remove uh, hooks with esophageal surgeries um, and treatment, uh, topical treatment of the wound to prevent infections. These, however, are um, one of the most common and one of the most deadly uh, injuries that we see in our hospital here. And this is um, an unintended harmful boater interaction is really what we call it because boating is a really big part of the lifestyle here in South Florida. And I think that many of you might agree or might even fall into this category that a lot of our, our marine stewards come from the boating community. Um, and there aren't a whole lot of cases that we're aware of where people will intentionally strike sea turtles. It's really the lack of understanding of where these sea turtles might be, um, when nesting season is, when we're having an aggregation or a lot of sea turtles come back to our area for the nesting season, and then what to do in the event that you do see a sea turtle, what are those safety precautions. So that's what we do here is we work um, hand in hand with the, with the recreational um, boating community to try and deliver best practices to them. What you're seeing here is uh, the age class is a post hatchling. So this is just a little bit bigger than those hatchlings that you saw in the video earlier in some of the pictures. This turtle is what we call a washback. Um, so it had successfully emerged from its nest, went, took that long, long swim into the ocean, found the seaweed patches um, like it should for refuge, but unfortunately got washed back into shore. Well, what we find with almost 100% um, of our hatchlings, of our, of our washbacks, is ingestion of these um, microplastics. Um, I actually have some here, although you'll probably have a better perspective with the picture. I'm gonna see if I can't line this up. <laughs> but what, what you're looking at is a vial um, full of uh, marine microplastics that were actually taken out of the gut of a, a washback turtle. So here's another one. You can see that they fill these very small vials pretty full. Um, unfortunately, this is something that we see very often. And while a lot of environmental education focuses on marine debris and um, abolishing and eliminating or reducing, let's say, or refusing even better, 
um, these single use plastics. Well, what we see here is truly a testament to all of uh, what that education is saying. Um, it, it allows us a very unique platform to say, well, here's this marine animal that came to us um, as an indicator species, and this is what it's showing us. So we do unfortunately see a lot of effects of marine debris in our patients. Okay. All right. So that's, uh, that's my short semi-long semi spiel about the importance of the ocean and how sea turtles play a role in ocean health. Um, um, but I know that you all are probably here today to see the main part of the show, which is really a sea turtle nesting and laying her eggs on one of our beaches. I'm just gonna pause here before I start a video. And the video was taken with all infrared uh, videography, meaning that there were no lights used during the filming of any of these shots, believe it or not, because it does look quite bright. Um, and I'm gonna stop here before we start the video just for a couple of questions, if there's anything super pressing, but we will have time after the video for um, other questions and answers. The only one I see here is what are the north and south boundaries of the 10 mile beach that you monitor? So um, our south boundary is just uh, the northern end of Singer Island by MacArthur Beach State Park. And we go all the way up uh, on Jupiter Island into Tequesta. Um, more or less at the county line uh, with Palm Beach and Martin County. We go about that far north and that equates about nine and a half to ten miles of beach. All right, I don't see, let's see, what's the status of your facility rebuilding? Jerry, I love that question. I definitely want to answer it, but that's a longer answer, so <laughs> I will save that till the end. So while we're um, on that note, while we are watching uh, the video, feel free to start typing in questions um, about the first half of the presentation and then what we're about to watch. So I want to set the mood for you all a little bit. Um, I don't think I can, hold on, I'll be right back. All right, so I'm going to set the mood for you. And we are going to go down. <laughs> you didn't know you were going to get theatrics tonight. So we're going to go down onto the beach. And we are. Um, what you're going to be seeing first and foremost is what the public would see on our um, turtle walk program. So every season we take guests down onto the beach where they can witness this egg laying process and return to the ocean. Now the reason why you are not seeing in our film tonight um, the emergence process and the steps of actually building and constructing the egg chamber is because that's a very delicate part of the process where there's a very high risk of um, deterring the mother from actually committing to laying her eggs and we definitely don't want to do that. Now, our researchers are on the beach at night. They're highly trained to navigate um, this risk of activity on the beach. Um, but one thing that we very, very much urge um, locals and tourists alike not to do is to be on the beach at night. So to set the stage for this video, you are going to be transported down onto the beach once she has already dug what we call her egg chamber, and she is now depositing her egg. So feel free to um, start chatting in the question and answer um, box. And I'm just going to narrate what's happening for you. So there are generally seven steps of the nesting process. And I mentioned a couple of them already. One of which, of course, is emergence from the ocean. And then after emergence, they will do what's called body pitting, where they crawl up the beach and they use their primarily front end primarily front, but some of their back flippers to clear some of the dry sand away from the nesting site so she can get to that uh, more saturated, wet, easily constructible um, sand because she wants, to, she wants to dig out a hole that's going to stay. It would be the, if she didn't do the body pitting process, it would be the equivalent of you trying to dig a hole in, 
in the Saharan desert in dry sand. It would be very, very hard. So once she body pits, she will then start excavating what we call the egg chamber. And that's what you're looking at here. Okay, so this is the egg chamber where she's depositing her eggs, okay? Once she has constructed the chamber, of course, then she'll start depositing, which is what you're watching now. So if you watch here, I'm sure you have seen the eggs dropping. So you'll see they come two to three at a time. Um, you can see her rear flippers here will go up in a contraction. There was one here, right? So you can see when those eggs drop, she will um, perhaps involuntarily, right? Try and push those out and her flippers will go up uh, during that muscular contraction. Um, a lot of people notice that and it's just so, it's so interesting to think about how when we give birth, we have contractions, right? Well, so do these animals that we're watching. So it's just another one of those connections um, with, with this animal, another example. So what you're looking at here is called the cloaca. The cloacal opening is located at the tip of the tail. This point here is the tail. Many people, um, don't know or maybe don't put don't connect the dots that uh, females do have tails too, male and females. However, male sea turtles do have a longer tail to aid in the reproductive process. And this short stubby tail um, is an indicator that it's a female. And then of course, here's the cloaca up close. So you can see those eggs passing. So in real time, um, this process, depending on the mother, can take 45 minutes or it can take a couple hours. It also depends on the species as well. So just think if you were a loggerhead sea turtle versus a leatherback sea turtle, well, you're going to have a whole lot more um, body to have to move up and down a beach, right? If you're a leatherback versus um, a loggerhead or a green. Well, I think we froze here. Let's see if I can get my screen back. Here we go. I think we're having some video issues. Sorry, folks, give me a moment. Stand by. While I'm pulling up this presentation again, I will join you again and answer some of your questions. Sorry about that, folks. All right, so I did have some questions coming in while this is reloading. Um, what do you attribute to the increase in leatherback turtle nests by Ann and Ken? Great question. Um, in fact, over time, we've, we're actually seeing a decline in the leatherback population, unfortunately. Um, but there are natural peaks and valleys to sea turtle nesting across all species. Um, so this just happens to be on the upswing of the natural dips and, uh, or sorry, peaks and valleys across um, all the years. So sea turtles tend to nest um, every um, two to three years. They don't nest, they don't tend to nest every season. So um, what we're seeing this year is just a higher um, 
year compared to others. Okay, let's see. Looks like I can get this back running for us. Thanks for your patience, everybody. All right, so I'll start answering a couple more questions. Sorry about that. So let's see, Jeanette, so glad you enjoyed the presentation. You've participated in beach cleanups, wonderful. How deep is the egg chamber? Well, that's a great question. Um, it, it actually depends on the length of the female's flippers. <laughs> so you can see that she's very limited based on how long her flippers are to really be digging out that egg chamber, right? So depending on the mother it's de and the species, they're gonna be larger or smaller and that's gonna dictate the depth of the nest. So generally they're about one and a half to three feet, but some nests can be quite, quite deep. All right, so I'll get to these questions in a second. What you're looking at now is she's using her rear flippers to cover the hole. So she's now finished the, de the deposition process where she has deposited about 80 to 120 eggs for loggerheads. Um, and she's, you can see how, how tactile the rear flippers are here. She's grabbing, you know, those piles of sand that she had previously cleared out and she's using her rear flippers almost like hands, right? And they do have digits under there, let's not forget, right? Um, they're just webbed digits. So um, she's using those rear flippers to take that sand and fill in the hole and you can see that she needs it as well. So she's packing that sand um, into the hole to ensure that those babies, those eggs are, are tightly packed. Okay. So you'll see her use this joint to roll the sand into the nest. So the digits are scooping or serving as a scoop and the joint is serving as um, pressure. Couple other questions. How long does it take her to lay all these eggs? It looks like a slow process. It can be. Again, like I had mentioned earlier, it depends on the mother. If it's earlier in the season, they may have more energy and they may have more eggs to drop. If it's later in the season, because they do tend to fast um, during nesting season, she may have fewer eggs that are fertilized and ready to drop. Um, and she may take a little bit longer crawling up the beach and going through some of the stages. I'm so glad, Sheila, that you've had an experience uh, watching a sea turtle lay its eggs before. Yeah, Kat, I can definitely talk about spacer eggs. Great question. They are very interesting. Um, spacer eggs are smaller. Um, they look like eggs, but they're actually um, not, they, they're not embryo. They don't have an embryo in it. Um, and there's, a, there's different theories as to what spacer eggs might be for or, or why some sea turtles, primarily leatherback sea turtles, lay spacer eggs. Um, it could be um, excess calcium, like excess nutrient deposit that the mother is shedding and getting rid of. Um, others have kind of speculated that perhaps they serve as a cushion because the um, leatherback eggs are a little bit bigger and they kind of help fill gaps, but it's generally understood that it's an excess in nutrients getting rid um, through the system. But it is, uh, there's no yolk in, in spacer eggs. We typically find them, like I said, in leatherback nests, although spacer eggs have been found across green and loggerhead species. So why at night to lay eggs? Great question. Um, and do they ever lay in the daytime? Some of our mothers are, um, are, are caught by our early morning surveyors. And we actually did have quite a few leatherbacks within the last couple seasons that were uh, nesting during the day. There's so many factors and mechanisms that um, determine when a sea turtle and where a sea turtle, right, uh, respective to their natal beach that they lay their nests. So it's very complex um, system to look at. But generally, the sea turtles lay their eggs at night because they're under the cover of darkness. So generally, in most um, places in the world, there are le there's less predation rate um, if uh, they lay their eggs at, at night. However, there are some species that have evolved to actually lay their eggs during the, during the daytime in massive numbers. 
um, they're called arabatas, and mostly that's reserved for the olive and the Kemp's Ridleys. So some sea turtles actually have evolved to have a behavior where they do nest during the day. So I'm gonna stop there with questions just to kind of uh, narrate what's happening here. You can see that her front flippers have now started to move as well as her back flippers. And this is what we call the camouflage stage. So this turtle is now taking not only the sand that she has excavated from the nest, she has put that back now, but now she's taking sand from around the nest to throw back behind her um, to cover not only the track in the sand, but mostly the scent. So there are, while there may not be um, as many predators, i.e. us humans, right, um, around at night, um, there are some predators. And being bird people, you all might have an idea of a bird that likes to suck sea turtle nests. So I would be interested to see any chatter in the Q&A, uh, guesses on what bird we see often on our night surveys and our night walks. Um, but what she's doing is she's covering uh, the scent trail and she's covering her tracks and that is exactly why it's called camouflaging. Okay. Now before this switches scenes, I want to point out this dark spot below the eye on the nesting sea turtle. Those of you that may have seen this process before or are um, longtime Florida natives maybe, you may have heard something called turtle tears. Um, it's something that I think people have said for a long time um, in, in the communities, but really what it is, it's, it's the, the expulsion of a highly concentrated saline solution from the body um, that comes from what's called a salt gland that sits right behind the eyes. So it comes out in what looks like a tear duct, um, but, and this happens constantly um, with sea turtles. Those salt glands are, are filtering the water intake so that the turtle can have fresh water for survival like all animals need, um, but it's filtering out um, that dissolved um, salinity and then it expels it through um, these ducts. So it looks like the turtle is crying, maybe we want to say that it's such a beautiful process, uh, or maybe it's even painful, right? But that's simply not the case. The reason why um, that stream is there and that wetness is there is because it is a natural process that's expelling excess salts um, or dissolved minerals filtered out of water. Okay, so she's doing a great job here. You can see camouflaging her nest. You can tell that she takes rests between her camouflaging efforts. And then once she feels like she has done a good enough job, that's when she's going to start returning to the ocean. And that's what we're going to watch now. So sometimes it's tough to see the difference between the camouflage stage and her trying to return to the ocean because it is quite an effort. <laughs> it is quite an effort for her to, to get herself away from all of the um, you know, dips that she's created during the process. So you can see her, once she is done with the process, they generally return pretty quickly. Um, they are on a mission when they come up to nest and they do a very thorough job as you have observed. But once that process is done, they are not terrestrial animals. They actually are very heavy out of water, just like we're heavy out of water. Um, so it's a big effort for them to be on land. So they want to return back to um, their natural habitat or their primary natural habitat as soon as possible. Sea turtles do crawl a little bit differently. If you notice, um, this loggerhead sea turtle is doing like an army crawl, so alternating flippering, uh, flippers. Um, other sea turtle species, um, especially here in South Florida, primarily the leatherback and the green, they will do almost like a breaststroke and they'll walk with both of their flippers, right? So there she goes, successful nesting. And just as a reminder, um, we have had over 15,000 nests on our beach so far, on our beaches that we monitor um, here in Juneau, Jupiter, and Tequesta. As my final reminder before I get to, what is the need for my headlight? There is no need for my headlight, this is theatrics. <laughs> it's just for fun, no need for my headlight. Um, so I did just want to remind you all um, that this was, this footage was taken, um, I'm going to stop my, my sharing now because that's the end of my presentation, um, or maybe I'll just get us up to a better screen.
Here we go. Okay, I'll stop it there. Um, so thank you for joining me today. I do want to answer some of these questions. And Scott um, or Clive, if you're moderating too, feel free to pop in and tell me that I'm out of time. <laughs> um, so I believe, Scott, you wanted to moderate some of these questions. Do you want to jump in? Uh, no, I'm fine. You're doing a, you're doing a much better job than I could ever do, Hannah. You're. <laughs> I, I don't believe that, but okay, I'll keep going. Um, so let's see. The ratio of male to female hatchlings has global warming affected those numbers. So there is a lot of research being done on this exact question. So how is um, climate change going to affect the uh, success of sea turtle populations in the future, especially because for those of you that don't know, um, their uh, embryonic development is, uh, or their, their sexual determination is highly contingent on temperature during the incubation period. So the warmer the temperatures, the more the uh, population will be skewed towards females. Um, and less towards males. And generally, in a population, you do, especially in a polygamous population, you do want more females than males, um, but it has serious implications for, um, for reproductive and, and population issues. But there's a lot of uh, research still ongoing with that as we learn more. Remember, these are marine animals and we're terrestrial animals, so we have a very narrow and limited um, exposure, although they do come up during nesting season, but we have a limited exposure to the paternity, um, so males. So unless they strand, like here in the hospital, we're in a very um, unique position to see both males and females um, in our hospital. But generally, we don't have a lot of opportunity to study um, the population of males um, after they leave the beaches as hatchlings. Um, beach erosion is increasing. How does introduced sand impact uh, sea turtles and marine life? Great question, Mary. Um, beach erosion is a big problem, especially with some of our coastal armoring um, that we've put in over the last few decades. So believe it or not, um, we there's some mixed reviews on this. So upland sand that has been brought to the coast as uh, dune renourishment projects have actually yielded a higher success rate um, in sea turtle uh, hatch success. So how many hatchlings are successfully hatching out of a nest um, on our beaches based on some of our studies, which you wouldn't really expect because it's a, it's a non-natural sand to be in that area, at least at this time. Um, uh, beach restoration projects where they're maybe um, bringing in sand from offshore, the grain size is very different because it hasn't gone through that additional time weathering um, as it washes ashore. Um, there's a lot of studies going on about how grain size perhaps affects um, hatch success. But so there are some uh, results, I think, namely um, what we find when we do excavations on coarse uh, renourished beaches, um, sometimes uh, a lot of sea turtles will get stuck in the natural emergence process because the sand is so much more coarse and heavier that the emergence is, is a little bit more challenging for them to come out. So there, there are definitely some impacts that we see from renourishment projects. Um, fortunately for renourishment projects, they are required to have some permitting and some monitoring by organizations like us and many others um, that are constantly assessing and evaluating the impacts on wildlife. <laughs> Sue, your question about my headlight. Um, Lillian, how did the nest fare after the hurricane this past weekend? So glad that came up in a private question actually to me earlier. So I do have some numbers here for you. Um, fortunately, as you all know, we kind of dodged a bullet with Hurricane um, Isaias. <laughs> I don't think I still know how to pronounce it. Um, we saw about 8% uh, loggerhead nest lost, um, about 2% green nest loss, and, and less than 1% leatherback loss. And the reason why the fluctuation between species is really because of the 
the timing where these when these species nest. Um, right now, loggerheads are nesting in pretty high numbers, whereas greens are kind of just getting started or continuing to be in peak. And uh, leatherback nests have pretty much all hatched out for the seasons. But overall, we lost about 4% of our total nesting number, um, which is very low. It might sound high and it's definitely a lot, of, a lot of eggs that were washed out, but considering what it could have been, if it was a stronger storm, um, we're considering ourselves pretty lucky. Um, I saw the guesses from my earlier question, fish crow and yellow crown night heron, and I'm glad I see the night heron in here. We do see fish crows, especially in the early morning. Um, on our beaches and they'll actually post up on the nesting stakes, which is very rude of them, in my opinion. Um, but the yellow crown night heron is an expert stalker and they will stand and they'll look at the stake and they'll look at the you know sand and they'll just wait and they're definitely waiting for dinner. So great guesses. Um, how bad is plastic pollution for sea turtles? Do you have recommendations for how we can reduce our own impact with plastic pollution, i.e. identifying and avoiding products with microplastics? Absolutely. Um, so I think what I like to remind people the most to keep this short and sweet, although I would love to chat um, off, you know, pre after the presentation with you and connect with all of you about um, more on this question. Um, but I think what I like to say is a lot of people remember uh, reduce, reuse, recycle. Well, there's a fourth R <laughs> that is very, very important, and it's refuse. Um, there are some other uh, iterations that, that other people use, other R's that are used as well. But refusing is probably the single strongest power that we have to reduce the marine debris problem. So finding reusable and more sustainable solutions to some of our single use um, products, um, both at the commercial level and production and also obviously on our individual level. So what the consumers are demanding is going to be a big part of that driver. So if there's ever um, a product that you, you know, do, an, do a plastic audit in your house. I always encourage people to do this. Um, if uh, you find yourself using, you know, 30 Ziploc bags in a week or, you know, a hundred you know, um, plastic bags from the grocery store, well then it would be a very wise investment for yourself and the planet um, if you got those reusable bags or even the silicone or freezable reusable Ziplocs that are actually dishwasher safe now, which is pretty incredible because that wasn't always the case. So there's more and more and more reusable products that are coming out that replace single use products and I would definitely recommend all of you to look into some of those resources. Do we see a lot of false crawls? Great question. Um, I actually did not talk um, about false crawls, but the false crawls are when a sea turtle will emerge out of the ocean and for a number of different varying reasons, uh, she may not decide to commit to a nest. Um, false crawls are definitely known to increase um, with human activity. Um, we are a predator, whether we look at ourselves as that as or, or not. Um, so more human activity on the beach definitely leads to a decrease in successful nesting. Um, so those of you that um, are tempted to host your own turtle walk and go on a night walk, I would really strongly advise you not to do that. You know, they're public beaches. Unfortunately, they're not closed to the public at night. You can be out there, um, but it is one of the worst things that you can do for our sea turtle population. The best thing you can do if you want to get a glimpse in real life when COVID-19 is over um, in this kind of uh, experience is to book through an organization that is permitted to, like us, and I promise this isn't a plug, there are many other um, organizations that hold the permit as well from the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, book an experience through them, support the conservation efforts with your program fee. Oftentimes it's very nominal. Um, and that way, the people that want the experience are consolidated and they are doing it under the best practices known by the permit holder. Okay. Um, what are all those lights? Are they not monitored? Great question. So you see in some of the footage during, during the video, there was a lot of light pollution. One of the things that, um, there are lighting ordinances across the county, but one of the things that we battle the most is interior lighting. Um, especially with tourists that are staying in um, like hotel and resort residences and might not know about the harmful effects on our nesting sea turtles during uh, nesting season. So 
Um, we have a couple educational campaigns that try and target tourists that may not know, but it's a very fine balance between telling them too much and telling them <laughs> just enough, right? Um, because it, it takes a, a lot of understanding not to be tempted to access these beaches at night to have that, you know, one, what, what a lot of people consider a once in a lifetime experience. So um, we do work a lot with hotels and resorts to share best practices through their staff with their guests. Um, let's see. Oh, BJ, thank you so much. I'm glad you learned a lot. What's the biggest leatherback turtle I've ever seen? Her name is Kelly Clarkson. <laughs> we nicknamed her Kelly Clarkson. Um, and I don't know her measurements offhand. Actually, she's probably one of our smaller leatherbacks. There are larger mothers um, that we have tagged and we see um, every other year on those peaks and valleys. Um, but she is, she's just enormous. I wish I had a photo that I can quickly bring up, but I don't, uh, it would take me too long and we've already suffered some setbacks. Um, but these, these turtles, when you really look at the comparison between the animal and a person, even a, a, a tall grown person, six feet or more, I mean, the, it, the difference is shocking. The, the leatherbacks can get up to about eight to nine feet in length. If female lays more than once, up to three or four times a day. Uh, Sue, if you want to retype your question, I'm not sure what you mean there. Kat, thanks so much. Um, I'm glad you enjoyed. If we have more storms, do, nor do more nest wash out? Frederick, great question. Yes, um, with any storm, with the storm surge and the changing coastline, chances are we are going to have some percentage loss. Um, but it is important to remember all those storms have gotten more severe because of climate change. Generally, storms are a natural process. So like I had mentioned before, all of those eggs that these turtles are laying, that's really helpful for them to combat that loss. Excessive sargasm is an issue for baby sea turtles returning to sea. However, I would, um, if you are a morning beach walker, that is the best time um, to have a great chance of not only seeing a residual nesting sea turtle without harming or, or posing a threat during the nighttime um, of deterring um, the majority of nesting. But if you're taking morning beach walks um, on some of our beaches, I recommend um, after after dawn or, or right before sunrise. And you might catch uh, a sea turtle wrapping up her nesting and you might see a hatch out or an emergence. And what I, what I encourage all of you to do is even though we do have a lot of sargasm and some of that is human uh, because of human impact, they are pretty tenacious, these turtles. And you know we like to project, um, you know, we like to help and we like to look at these poor baby turtles that are really struggling during their first steps. But remember what I told you about imprinting. So it's really important that we let, um, in general with wildlife conservation, that we let the natural process happen as best as we can. Um, with the increased sargasm, if you do see a, a, a excessive amount and you do see hatchlings that are struggling through it, to, to thin out some of that sargasm might not be the worst thing, but um, we definitely don't want to encourage any handling of the sea turtles um, or removal of the sargasm from the beach because it can be um, a really important nutrient additive to, to that ecosystem. So my, my short answer, Jeannie, would be try and leave it alone. Um, if you see a particular turtle that is struggling, um, then I, I would give it time and, and fight the urges to assist or especially don't fight off the birds, but I'm sure that I don't have to tell you folks that because they unfortunately need to eat too, right? Um, just let the natural process happen, sit back and, and see what happens. I think everyone will be pleasantly surprised. Um, I'm glad that people are using environmentally friendly compostable products. Susan, thank you. Um, I'm glad you enjoyed the presentation. How far away are you when you watch them lay their eggs, Pam asks. Um, we do generally like to keep about a 15 foot distance when we're filming. That's the recommended distance um, for any wildlife encounters. However, on these permitted turtle walks that a lot of organizations like ours host, you actually are permitted to get quite close to the turtle, up to about five feet behind the turtle while she's depositing her eggs. Um, and obviously we, monitor the activity of the guests around the animal very closely and it is a very safe um, and and uh, legal way to to view the process 
Um, encourage member to bring their own utensils to our potlucks. Yes, please, Kat, that is excellent. Um, Marsha, I'm sorry you missed the beginning of it too, but that's okay. I think it's being recorded, so you might be able to watch it later. Um, Clive and Cece, oh my goodness. Um, I can't thank you both enough for the wonderful introduction. You had a question about turtle monitoring. What's the criteria for release turtles to be given a satellite tracker, I think is what you are talking about. So honestly, it's a little bit resource limited. Um, so uh, satellite trackers are very expensive. So um, in order, if we could, we would satellite track almost all of our patients. There are some patients that are perhaps too small um, to adhere a satellite tracker to safely, et cetera. But for the, for the majority of the time from our sea turtle hospital, the reason why we wouldn't satellite tag is that we just don't simply have enough financial resources to tag all of our turtles. So if you know anyone that is looking <laughs> to support satellite tagged research of sea turtles, we are certainly open to meeting them and giving them more information. Um, how can we get involved in beach monitoring and research? Great question. Um, this is something that's typically limited to people that have been specially trained, but there are organizations that do accept volunteers. Um, I know a few, uh, one particular organization on Singer Island. Um, there are other organizations, especially on the west coast of Florida, which I'm sure doesn't help a lot of you. I'm not sure where you're tuning in from. Um, but there is a, a call out for volunteers sometimes to help with shorter stretches of beach that you can easily walk. Um, unfortunately, well, fortunately for us, because it's a heavily densely nested beach, um, we do use all terrain vehicles or ATVs on our beach, which kind of um, limits the, um, how volunteers can help us on our beach and the density, trust me, is very intense. Um, but there, I would encourage you to look in your local area, look to local uh, coastal wildlife centers to see if they hold a permit for sea turtle monitoring. And if they take volunteer service, you might be surprised what you find. All right, I think, oh, I have one more. Do we track hatchlings and how would you do that? Um, we do not track hatchlings here. It's very challenging, but there have been post hatchlings that have been tracked. The trouble with um, tracking smaller turtles is the weight of the tracker, um, although they have been modified to be much smaller, but also the, the growth of the uh, shell is a little bit, um, they, they grow quite fast, so the adhesive doesn't tend to be very successful with smaller turtles. And I think with that, I got to all of your, your 87 questions. I'm so happy this was such an active, uh, active presentation, I really hope. Um, that you enjoyed it, everybody. So Hannah, thank you. That was a wonderful presentation. I can't thank you enough for <laughs> being with us this, this evening. And to those of you who have stayed throughout and uh, for Hannah's wonderful answers to the question, thank you for joining us this evening. Um, next uh, month, uh, we will uh, be having um, on Tuesday, September 1st again, we'll have Jennifer Reynolds and she will be our featured speaker that evening on protecting South Florida's watershed. Um, I look forward to that presentation. Again, she is the a retired a Lieutenant Colonel who was in charge of Everglades restoration for the Army Corps of Engineers. So have a great rest of your night. Um, have a safe journey from your computer screen to your kitchen or living room or bedroom or wherever you're going in your house. And join us again on August, on September 1st, for uh, Jennifer Reynolds. Thank you. Good night, everybody.